Happy Sabbath. It's a blessing to be here with you. And I'm not going to spend too much time talking right now because there's so much that we need to look at in the Word of God. Amen? And so as it is my tradition, I want to invite you all to have a word of prayer with me. And I counsel everyone here, everyone that's watching on television, please earnestly ask for the Spirit of God to speak to your heart. Without the Holy Spirit, we cannot understand the Word of God. Without the Holy Spirit, we don't have the power to do the will of God. And so I'm inviting you to pray with me to ask for the presence of the Lord to be our instructor as we open up His Holy Scriptures. So let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the blessing of the Holy Sabbath rest. And I thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, that you sent down into this world that we might be partakers of thy divine nature. I want to thank you for your grace and for your mercy. You're worthy to be praised, Father. I kneel here before you and I come with all of my brothers and sisters before thy, fr before thy throne in faith, and I'm asking that you would just cleanse our hearts of all sin and send your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, to guide and direct us into all truth. Lord, I claim your promise. You said, call unto me, and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Lord, please illuminate our minds. Open up our understanding. Send your angels that excel in strength, that stand in your presence. May they be here with us. May they declare the message to us. And Lord, you know my weakness and my frailty at this time. Cleanse me of all pride and self-trust and self-righteousness. Just use me as a conduit for your namesake. Thank you, Father. For these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3 and verse 15. And in Ecclesiastes, chapter 3 and verse 15, we looked at this the very first time we came together during this series. There's a very important prophetic principle that I would all, that I desire for all of us to just take time to consider before we get deeply into our message for this morning. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 15, that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God requireth that which is past. In other words, the things that have taken place in the past, they're taking place right now in our present day society, and the things that will transpire in the very near future, they have at least in principle taken place in the past. Therefore, God requires us, he commands us, to have a knowledge of historic events, especially those that have impacted his people throughout antiquity so that we can better understand what's going on right now and what is going to unfold in the very near future. With that in mind, I want you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew chapter 24. Most of us here are familiar with Matthew chapter 24. Jesus is responding to the inquiry of his disciples concerning when would be the destruction of Jerusalem, the signs foreshadowing his second coming and the end of the world. And we know that Jesus makes mention of many things. In verse 7, he talks about how nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom, how there'll be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. In verse 8, he says, all these are the beginnings of sorrows. The Bible says something that Jesus said, very interesting. It's found in Matthew chapter 24, and we're going to look at verse 15. Matthew 24 and verse 15. We're told there, and when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let them that be in Judea flee into the mountains. When you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let them that be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now when you're looking at this, you may say, abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. If you're not familiar with this passage of scripture, it may be a bit hard for you to comprehend what's being presented to us here. But in the book of Luke, if you open your Bibles there, in Luke chapter 21, we're going to begin at verse 20. Luke gives a statement, or rather relays to us the statement, concerning this very same time frame in which Jesus was relaying to his disciples what will be the signs of his coming and the end of the world and the destruction of Jerusalem? He says this in Luke chapter 21 and verse 20. He says, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them that be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now it's clear that what we're looking at here in, here in Luke chapter 21, 
1 and verse 20, and also in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15, they're the exact same instances. Both times we see these events in which Christ counsels his people to flee into the mountains. Do you see that? It's very clear. Therefore, whatever this abomination of desolation is, it must be directly associated with these armies that are going to compass Jerusalem. These armies are evidently the power that are going to be responsible for the desolating or the destruction of Jerusalem. And when they see these armies compassing Jerusalem, then those that are in Judea should flee into the mountains. Now the question is, what armies would compass Jerusalem? And I want you to just apply your mind to the scripture right now as if you've never read this before. What armies would be responsible for compassing Jerusalem? How would we find this information? It's clear. It's right there in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. The word of God says, And when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. One thing is clear. Whatever this abomination of desolation is, it was spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So if we go to the writings of Daniel, we'll be able to find out what armies were responsible for compassing Jerusalem. Open your Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, there's a very important prophetic time period that's presented to us concerning a probationary frame of time that God has given to the children of Israel to accomplish a specific work. But I want you to see what the Bible says here in Daniel chapter 9, and I'm going to look at verse 26. It says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now, if you're not familiar with this, this may be elusive to you once again. Three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. What is this all talking about? Well, if you look at verse 23, let's start 25. Let's just start from right there. It makes it very interesting. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The city, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So this, this prophetic time period, this 69 weeks here, the first seven weeks are appointed unto the children of Israel. They're supposed to accomplish a work. The rebuilding and the restoration of Jerusalem, the restoration of its civil power. There would be a decree that would be made, and from that time period, they would have seven weeks to accomplish this work. And we found out the other day as we were studying the word of God together that in prophetic time, a day is equal to a year. We see this in the book of Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34 and Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6. So when we're looking at seven weeks, you know you have seven days in a week, multiply seven times seven, you have 49. So it's not 49 days, but 49 literal years. 49 years the people of Israel would have to accomplish this work of the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the full rest restoration of its civil power. And the decree went forth, many of you know, in the year 457 BC by a Persian king by the name of Artaxerxes that gave them the command to go forward to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. They accomplished this work by the year 408 BC. From that point, we're having three score and two weeks before we see Messiah revealed on the scene. Messiah we know is Jesus Christ. A score is 20. So three scores is three times 20, you have 60. 62 weeks. In 62 weeks from 408 BC, we would see the Messiah come on the scene. If you were to subtract 434, because that's what you're going to get if you multiply 7 times 62, you get 434. If you were to subtract 434 from 408, it would give you negative 26. But we're counting years, right? We're counting years. There's no such thing as a negative year or a zero year. So it brings us to the year 27 AD. 27 AD was when Jesus Christ was baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. The Holy Spirit came down upon him as a dove. Amen? So when we're looking at the book of Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, and I just want it to be as simple as possible here. Verse 26, when it says, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, it's saying after 27 AD, the Messiah will be cut off. Now, when was the Messiah cut off? What event marked the cutting off of the Messiah? It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Let's just look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53, and let's look at verse 8. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, and we're going to look at verse 8. It says something 
here concerning the cutting off of the Messiah. It says, he was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. This is directly speaking of the crucifixion of the Messiah. So after three score and two weeks, Messiah would be cut off. Or after 27 AD, Jesus Christ would be crucified on the cross for the sins of his people. But then the Bible makes a very important statement, and I don't want you to miss this. It says, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So around the time when Jesus Christ was getting ready to be crucified on the cross, which we know was in the year 31 AD, there was a people that would come shortly thereafter, but it makes a very important statement there. The people of the prince that shall come. Who is this prince that was going to come around the time when Jesus Christ was being crucified on the cross? Open your Bibles to the book of John. I just want you to see all these things clearly from the Bible. And I want to deal with all of these minute details because if we don't, then we will not be able to clearly see how we will see a repetition of these events in our present day. In the book of John chapter 14, as Jesus now is making his final preparations to go to the cross, and he's giving counsel to his disciples, words of encouragement, he makes this statement. John chapter 14, looking at verse 30, the Bible says this. Jesus says this. Hereafter, I will not talk with thee much. Why? For the prince of this world cometh, and he hath nothing in me. So around the time when Messiah was getting ready to be cut off, he said, I'm not going to continue to talk too much with you because the prince of this world cometh and he hath nothing in me. Who is the prince of this world, ladies and gentlemen? The prince of the world is none other than the devil and Satan himself. Now, is there a people in the Bible that were directly connected to the devil and Satan? Open your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation chapter 12, we're going to begin at verse 9. The Bible gives us another symbolic title for the devil and Satan, the prince of this world. Revelation 12 and verse 9, the Bible says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The Bible also identifies the devil as the dragon. And as we look at Revelation chapter 12, we're going to find out that there were people directly connected to the dragon. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3, the word of God makes this statement. Revelation chapter 12, and I'm looking, beginning at the third verse. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and upon its head seven crowns. Word of God goes on to say, And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and to cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, to devour her child as soon as he was born. And the woman brought forth a man child, which was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And he was caught up unto God and to his throne. So here we have this scene of the devil, the dragon, standing before this woman, ready to devour this child that was going to be born unto this woman as soon as this man-child was born. Now, before we go on to address the activities of the dragon, we need to address this symbol of the woman. We looked at this the other night, that a woman in Bible prophecy is a symbol of God's people, his church. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 2 makes it very clear. I've likened the daughter of Zion unto a comely and delicate woman. Then in the book of Isaiah, chapter 51 and verse 16, the Bible goes on to say, at the very end of that scripture, say unto Zion, thou art my people. So Zion is the people of God, and God likens the daughter of Zion, he likens his people unto a comely and delicate woman. This woman in Revelation chapter 12 that we're looking at is a symbol of the people of God. And according to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4, the dragon stood before the people of God to devour a man-child that would be born unto the people of God as soon as this man-child was born. Now, do we know of a man-child that was born unto the people of God? It's clear. It's in the book of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. You all know the scripture. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Who are we talking about here? None other than Jesus Christ. 
So the word of God is telling us that at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ, the dragon stood up to devour him, to destroy him, to annihilate him as soon as he was born. The Bible says this dragon has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon its heads. Now, is there a verse of scripture from Genesis to Revelation that you will find the devil as a dragon with seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns upon its head, standing in the manger, waiting before Mary with his jaws open, ready to consume Jesus as soon as he came out of her womb? There's no such scripture in the Bible. Genesis to Revelation, you can look as much as you want to. You won't find anything like that. But Matthew chapter 2, let's look at Matthew chapter 2 beginning at verse 1. We're trying to find out who these armies were that would surround Jerusalem. This is very important that we go through all of this because, brothers and sisters, we are getting ready to see a repeat of this history. In the book of Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says this. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east to where? To Jerusalem. So when Jesus was being born in Bethlehem, Herod was ruling, and Herod was ruling under the authority that was given unto him by the pagan Roman Empire. Now, I want you to see what the Bible says concerning the activities of Herod at the time of Jesus' birth. Look at Matthew chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 13 now. And when they were departed, speaking of the wise men, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise! And take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. Why? And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Looking at verse 16 now. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth. He was exceeding wroth. And sent forth and slew all the children that were in Judea from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Do you see what the Bible is telling us right here? When Jesus was born, there was a decree sent forth that sent out the armies of pagan Rome throughout the land to try and wipe out the life of the Messiah at the time of his birth. The armies of pagan Rome in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4 are being spoken of as the actions of the dragon himself. You see, the armies of pagan Rome were being used by the dragon, the devil, to accomplish his work. These were the people of the prince. It was Rome that surrounded Jerusalem. History teaches us that. And I want you to see something. Go back with me, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 is so important that we look at all of these details. It's very important. Daniel chapter 9, we're looking at verse 26 once again. It says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. The word end there doesn't mean the conclusion. It means the beginning of the process will be with the flood. The beginning of the process of the desolation or the destruction of Jerusalem would be with a flood. What is this flood? The Bible gives us clear information about what this flood is in the book of Psalms chapter 18 and verse 4. David makes a very interesting statement concerning the flood. Psalms, the 18th chapter, we're going to look at verse 4 now. This is what the prophet and the king David had to say that is so relevant to us right now. He says, the sorrows of death compass me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. What are these floods? These floods are a symbol of ungodly men. Ungodly men that would move forward in a violent fashion, just like water when it's moving with all of its force. If you ever think of ungodly men, you definitely could think of the pagan Roman armies. Heathen ungodly men. And it says, when those floods of ungodly men would come, it would make them afraid. Very interesting. It doesn't just mean that it would cause them to fear, but they would fear because they would know that a time of trouble was coming upon them. So what are we looking at here? I want you to go back with me, Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to look at a few things. Matthew chapter 24, look at verse 15 with me. Matthew chapter 24, looking at verse 15. And when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Okay, we know the desolating power that is the armies of Rome. And according to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15, when the armies of Rome would come, they would have some abominations in their possession. When we saw the abominations of the armies of Rome standing in the holy place, 
then those that are in Judea should flee into the mountains. And when the armies of Rome would come, according to Matthew, Luke chapter 21 and verse 20, they would accomplish Jerusalem. Now, ladies and gentlemen, just let me ask you a couple of questions. If I accomplish you, does that mean I'm outside or inside? If I'm accomplishing you, I have to be outside. Am I right? So the armies of Rome would be outside of Jerusalem. But the Bible says that they would set up their abominations in the holy place. Now, when you think of a holy place, what do you think of? Think of a sanctuary, think of a temple. But where was the temple located, outside or inside? inside. It was inside. So wherever these abominations were set up, they weren't inside, but they had to be in a holy place, and that holy place had to be outside. What was this holy place? Remember, they were compassing Jerusalem. Open your Bibles quickly, Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 3. The Bible makes everything so plain. Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 3. This is what God had to say about Jerusalem and Mount Zion. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion and will dwell in the midst of of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, his holy mountain. What did God call Jerusalem and Zion? He called it his holy mountain. All the land was holy. So when they came with their abominations, and it's clear for us to understand what abominations they are because we know what armies we're dealing with right now. Because when the armies of pagan Rome went to battle, they always carried with them their standards that had the dragon on and on top, of the, on top of the flag that had the dragon, they would have their little idols. And when they came with their standards, like any army would do, they would put their flag down and they're saying, it is in the name of our God we come to conquer you, to subjugate you. And when they came and they laid siege on Jerusalem, they would set up their embattlements, they would dig trenches, they were prepared for war, but they didn't just go into the city and begin cutting and slashing. You see, they stood ready for combat, but they surrounded the city, and they would always have at least three months to three years worth of food because that's how long they might have to actually be outside of the city. Because every city had at least three months to three years worth of food just in case some army laid siege on them. Now I want you to think about this because it's so important for us to understand what is getting ready to happen. Think about this. You're inside of Jerusalem, and you can see dust kicking up in the distance. You can hear the marching of armies, and it's very clear that an army is getting ready to lay siege on your city. What is your first mode of action? Shut the gates. Shut the gates. I mean, that's the first thing you want to do. Shut the gates. Is that clear? But brothers and sisters, think about this now. So they're shutting the gates, and these armies are now surrounding what city? Jerusalem. Do you remember what God called Jerusalem in Zechariah chapter 8 and verse 3? He called Jerusalem the city of truth. You want to know why God called Jerusalem the city of truth? The Bible says something interesting about truth in the book of Psalms. Psalms 119 verse 151, I believe it is. Psalm 119 verse 151. Just open your Bible there with me quickly. Psalm, the 119th chapter, we're going to look at verse 151. Why did God call Jerusalem the city of truth? Psalm 119, we're looking at verse 151. The Bible says this, Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. This is the reason why God called Jerusalem the city of truth. It's because the inhabitants of Jerusalem possessed his truth. The inhabitants of Jerusalem were commandment keepers. Think with me. So, the armies of pagan Rome, they come and they surround Jerusalem. The inhabitants of Jerusalem, the commandment keepers, they shut the gates to protect themselves. But now what's going on? They no longer have the freedom to go in and come out. Or go out and come in. So as a result, the freedoms and liberties that the commandment keepers once enjoyed is now jeopardized. The liberties and the freedoms of the commandment keepers are now jeopardized. And I want you to think about this. Once they shut the gates, what else does this mean? You know, in the book of Nehemiah, it's very interesting. Nehemiah was, uh, he was a reformer of his time. One of his great reforms was Sabbath reform for Jerusalem. 
Men were coming into Jerusalem selling their goods, and he didn't want that. He put them outside of the city because he did not want them defiling God's holy Sabbath day. I want you to see what the Bible says here in Nehemiah chapter 13, beginning at verse 19, what happened when Nehemiah closed the gates of the city Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 19, the word of God says this, And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charged that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath, and some of my servants set eye at the gates, that there should no burden be brought in on the Sabbath. So the merchants and sellers of all kinds of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. So this is what happened. They shut the gates, and the merchants and the sellers, they couldn't come into Jerusalem. So when the gates of Jerusalem were shut, the people that were inside of Jerusalem, the commandment keepers, were restricted from buying and selling. Do you see what happened when the armies of pagan Rome surrounded Jerusalem? The, re the, the liberties and the freedoms that the commandment keepers once enjoyed, now jeopardized. They no longer can buy nor sell. I wonder if anything like that is getting ready to happen. Brothers and sisters, the word of God makes it clear that these things are getting ready to happen once again. The armies of the dragon, they're coming back again. You see, the Bible says something very interesting. And I want you to know that God's commandment keeping people, we will be under siege by the dragon once again in these last days. It says it right there, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Look at it in your Bibles. It says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went forth to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The dragon is going to go forward once again to make war with God's commandment keeping people. But from which direction is the dragon coming this time? Can't be pagan Rome. I don't think we're worried about Caesar. Caesar's long gone in the grave, isn't he? Look at Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, please turn your Bibles there with me quickly. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11, the Bible says this. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake like a dragon. Now, the Bible tells us in the book of Daniel chapter 7 and verse 2. And Daniel chapter 7 and verse 17. And Daniel chapter 7 and verse 23, that a beast in Bible prophecy is a symbol of a kingdom or a political power. If you're not familiar, I'll just share it with you. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 17 says, These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Verse 23 of Daniel chapter 7 says, Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. So a beast in Bible prophecy is a symbol of a kingdom, a political power. But I want you to look at Daniel chapter 7 verses 2 and 3 with me. Because there's two points that I want to highlight about these beasts in Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 2, the Bible says, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by the night, and behold, four, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, diverse one from another. So these beasts, these prophetic beasts, these kingdoms, these political powers, they are spoken of as coming up out of the waters in Daniel chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. The waters in the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and verse 15, are a symbol of kindreds, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So we're looking at political powers, kingdoms that would rise into prominence in a very highly populated place on planet Earth. But in Revelation, chapter 13 and verse 11, we're looking at a beast, a political power, rising up, not out of the water, but out of the earth. This is the direct opposite of the sea. Do you get my point right now? So if the waters are a symbol of a highly populated area, then the earth is a symbol of a very sparsely populated place on planet earth. And as this beast, this political power, would rise into prominence, it would have two horns like a lamb. The lamb primarily stands as a symbol of Jesus Christ in the word of God. The word of God makes it clear in the book of Matthew chapter 1. Matter of fact, John, I love that one better. John chapter 1 and verse 29 where John said, Behold the Lamb of God, speaking of Jesus Christ, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Lamb is a symbol of Jesus Christ. Letting us know that when this nation in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11 would be rising into prominence in a very sparsely populated place on planet Earth, we call it the New World, 
when it came into existence, it would profess itself to be a Christian nation, a nation that would promote the principles of Jesus Christ. Word of God said it would have two horns like a lamb. Horns in the Bible are a symbol of power. In the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3 and verse 4, the Word of God tells us this. Speaking of Jesus, once again, it says, His brightness was as the light. He had horns coming out of his hand, and therein was the hiding of his power. Horns in the Bible are a symbol of power. So this nation, as it rose into prominence, professing itself to be a Christian nation, there would be two pillars of strength, powers that would be associated with its government structure that would help it implement these Christ-like principles within the borders of its kingdom. You know the Bible speaks of some of the principles that are promoted by Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God? Right there in the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, looking at verse 1. Galatians chapter 5, looking at verse 1. It says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty whereth Christ hath made you free, and be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage. Notice that when Jesus Christ comes, he brings liberty and he brings freedom. The Lamb brings liberty and he brings freedom. So if we take all of these points together and look at this beast, this political power, in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11, we get a very clear picture. We're looking at a political power that would rise into prominence in a very sparsely populated place on planet Earth. I said it's the New World. As it rose, it would profess to be a Christian nation that would promote the principles of liberty and freedom. And let's just throw in justice for all. What nation do you have? Amen. United States of America. This once Christian nation that promoted liberty and freedom and justice for all, the Bible says one day it will speak like a dragon. And ladies and gentlemen, the only way that a nation can speak is through its legislative bodies and its judicial officials. Its court systems, its leaders are going to have to start to put in place legislation that completely go against its Christian values. They are going to have to start subverting the principles of our Constitution that help to promote liberty and freedom and justice for all as Christ would promote them. And we can know, whenever the nation begins to speak as a dragon, it will accomplish the design of the dragon. Make war with God's commandment-keeping people. Ladies and gentlemen, let's be frank. On June 26 of this year, when the highest court of the land, the Supreme Court of the United States of America, passed legislation, not passed legislation. They didn't pass legislation. When they ruled on the same-sex issue and now made this legal all across the board in the United States of America, what happened? Who is the author of marriage? God. So if the Supreme Court made legislation that redefined that which God established in the book of Genesis, we are looking at a court that has actually went against the word of God. Now you tell me, is that the speech of the dragon? And what I find so interesting about this is that they said, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. We're not going to force ministers to marry same-sex couples. And by the way, this is not an attack on individuals that are struggling with homosexuality. And I say struggling because sin is sin. He said, don't worry. If, he said, don't worry if we're not going to make ministers marry same-sex couples. What I find very interesting are some of the statements made by the Chief Justice, Justice Roberts, in his dissenting remarks on that case. He said that the court may have made it possible for religious believers to continue to advocate their beliefs. But our First Amendment rights give us the ability to exercise our religious beliefs. Exercise was a word that they ominously left out of their ruling on this issue. Are you getting what I'm saying? So they're saying, you can still teach what you want to teach, believe what you want to believe, but you cannot practice it. Matter of fact, Chief, Just Chief Justice Roberts, he made a very startling statement. He said, our people of faith, especially 
Non-profit organizations, we, we, there's no hope for you. You find no comfort in this ruling today, why? Let's say for instance you have uh, a university or a, an adoption agency, faith-based, and a same-sex couple comes to you and says, we want same-sex, we want the married student housing at your university, or we want to adopt a child into our home, and you refuse them that privilege. Because of this ruling, there's no umbrella. They can take that organization to the court, they can sue, they can win, and that organization can lose its nonprofit status. Ladies and gentlemen, let's be frank. Do you believe, is it clear, that the religious liberties and freedoms of God's people are right now on the chopping block? What's even more terrifying to me is the fact that the Sabbath and marriage are twin institutions. They were both established in the Garden of Eden. Jesus makes it very clear that they're inseparable. In, the Mark, in Mark chapter 2 and verse 27, he said, the Sabbath was made for man. It was made for our benefit. When God made man, he made male and female. Did he not? The family and the Sabbath are inseparable institutions. Matter of fact, in a wonderful book, written by Ellen G. White, Child Guidance. She said that they are in, the, the union that they share is indissoluble. You cannot dissolve that union. What does that mean to you? If you attack marriage, then what are you attacking? You're attacking the very nucleus of the family. But if you attack the family, then what are you attacking? You are automatically attacking the Sabbath. And oh, because we didn't hear them say this, we're saying, where are we getting this from? Brothers and sisters, the snowball is already rolling down the mountain. We're getting ready to see the avalanche. Amen. And it's going to come crashing on many of our heads. Because as all these things are going on, we're so caught up in the cares of this world that we're not realizing that we are looking at the final unfolding of prophecy. You see, when we look in the book of Revelation, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revealing of Jesus Christ. Where is Jesus right now? He's in the courts of heaven doing what? Interceding as our great high priest. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2 makes it very clear. Well, ladies and gentlemen, remember when the high priest would go into the sanctuary, he would have something on the bottom of his garments, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate. And as he walked in the sanctuary, the people could hear him moving. I can only imagine as they heard the bells getting softer, they knew he was, he was there in the most holy place doing the work. But as they heard the bells getting louder, they knew he was coming out. They knew he was getting ready to make his exit out of the sanctuary. All those things were symbolic. What are the antitypical application for these things? It's these prophetic events. These prophetic events are the clanging of the bells on the high priest's garment. As we see these things taking place, it's letting us know Jesus is getting ready to come out of the sanctuary. Amen. He's almost done with the cleansing. He's coming to get his children. But we have to stand. See, look at this. I want you to go back with me as we close. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew, the 24th chapter. Look at it clearly. Look at it closely. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24, looking at verse 15, we're going to go to verse 16, but looking at verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let them that be in Judea do what? Flee into the mountains. Look at the very next verse. Let him, which is on the housetop, not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him, which is in the field, return back to take his clothes. Now, this is interesting because when the armies of pagan Rome first surrounded Jerusalem, it was in the year 66 AD. For some unknown reason, they fell back and left. But four years later, in the year 70 AD, they came back led by Titus, and this time, they didn't leave. This time, it got so bad that the people inside of Jerusalem began to eat their own children. And when they went inside of that city, not one Christian was lost because they all heeded the instruction of Christ. 
when you see them come at the first, if you're on the housetop, don't go back down into the house to take anything out. If you're in the field, don't go back into the city to get anything. Just go. Now, Jesus first gave this prophecy in about 31 AD. The fulfillment of it came about 35 years later. So what should they, what should they have been doing for those 35 years? Come on, brethren, it's not hard. Preparation. What type of preparation? Come, you have to prepare. I mean, how much time would it take somebody to go from their housetop into their drawer to get their cell phone and run out the door? How much time? It wouldn't take any time. But Jesus says, when you see the sign, don't come off the housetop, just jump from rooftop to rooftop, jump over the wall, get out of there. But do you see the point? Our hearts must be so surrendered. Our minds must be so committed to obeying the will of God. Everything must be on the altar so that when the signs are fulfilling, we are ready to move on the word of God. Amen. And that's daily commitment to serving Jesus Christ. Daily commitment. It's not just going to happen when the event transpires. Oh, when National Sunday Law comes, I'm out of here. It's not going to happen like that, brothers and sisters. Are you really, you're really going to leave that nice new car you got? It comes, okay, but can we just get a few extra things for the children? But what about the furniture? Can we put that in? No, brother, and he said, leave. What type of mental preparation do we need? Listen, the only way we're going to be prepared for that crisis hour is by daily having a relationship with God. You see, when the employer comes to you and says, I need you to work on Sabbath. I need you to work. I know you say you can't work past Friday sunset, but I need you to work, on, work for me. I, I, I got to have this. And you say, you know what? I can't do it because my God tells me, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And you say, Lord, I can't, I, I'm sorry, boss, but I can't do it. And you lose your job and you go home. What's inside of the cupboards? Maybe a little spaghetti. You look like you like spaghetti. <laughs> little rice. Maybe some bread, a couple of fruit. You get on your knees, Lord, you know the children, you know my wife, but I'm going to honor you. A week passes, not so much spaghetti anymore. Rice finished, bread long gone. You go to Wednesday night prayer meeting and somebody gives you some more spaghetti. Here's my point, but God will always give you something to keep you going on. Shows you those signs. You say, okay, Lord, no job, but I still have food for the children. Still have food, still have a roof over our head. And you continue to stand fast in faith on the word of God that develops within you, that develops within you a patience. A patience to wait upon the fulfillment of the word of God. And then when you see God come through for you over and over and over again like that, when the crisis comes and you know it's time to flee and you're running, you're, you're shooting out of the house, you see the mountain before you, you're running towards the mountain. And in your head you're saying, I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. I don't know what I'm going to eat tonight. I have no idea, but I do know the God that I serve. Amen. And he's the same God that fed me, same God that clothed my children, same God that put a roof over my head. I will go, and he will be with me. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we have to have this experience because the situation is real, and it's right before us. I want to share with you a short testimony. It's impressed upon my mind to share it with you. A few years ago, as I worked as a call porter, Amen. I began to go to different first day congregations, sharing the health message, wonderful message that God has blessed us with. And I went into this series of buildings, one large building, and anyway, I, I walked around in there and I found an office and I spoke with the secretary and she let me know that I was at the headquarters of the ecumenical movement. Now, if you don't know what the ecumenical movement is, it, movement is, it's this movement to bring all the religious churches together, all faced together under one umbrella, and they acknowledge the, the Pope of Rome, 
as the leading authority in this conglomerate. And so she told me where I was, and then she got on the phone. And then shortly thereafter, one of the, direct, one of the directors came out. And uh, I put my hand out to shake his hand. He didn't shake my hand. I found that very interesting. But nonetheless, I told him why I was there. And as we began to talk, and we talked a little bit more, and we talked a little bit more, he stood back and he, he said, where did you go to school? And I told him where I went, dentist institution. And he said, I knew there was something different about you. You're a Seventh-day Adventist, aren't you? I was surprised that he knew of the, unit, of the, of the college. I said, yes, sir, I am. He paused, in the, he paused for a second, then he looked at me again, and he says, you know, best preacher I ever heard was a Seventh-day Adventist. He said he really knew his Bible. Then he began to talk about how this minister knew his Bible. Then he paused again, and he looked at me. And he said to me, so you know what we're doing here then? You know about the Council of Nice. You know about the Council of Laodicea. You know about 321 AD, what Constantine the Great did. He began to rattle off all of the history that I would use in a Daniel Revelation seminar to clearly outline who the Antichrist of Bible prophecy is. I was, I was so shocked. My mouth was, I could have caught every fly in the room. I mean, my mouth was open. And then I got real militant. I stood up straight and I said, so you know that I know what you know. <laughs> and he just put his head down, nodded his head. And what was so interesting about this meeting was the day previous, as I was driving in the car with my late father, and we were talking about Bible prophecy, he looked at me and he said, Chris, I wonder, do you think that these people that are a part of bringing Sunday to the forefront if they have any idea what they're doing. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. We are getting ready to see this union of church and state. It's knocking at our door. And God wants us to know it is time to be prepared. Because we do not develop character in the crisis we reveal the character that we have developed. Amen. And my prayer is that this day and every day that God gives us breath from henceforward, we will deny ourselves, pick up our crosses daily, and follow the Lamb with us wherever He leads us. Because this is our only safety in this crisis hour.